What? 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 Hey listeners, especially those of you who live in the San Antonio area, you got to save the date. Mark the date, September 7th, 2023, a leadership conference with the theme, God and Country, special speaker, General Jerry Boykin, September 7th, 2023. Annihilationism is a way to attempt to understand the justice of God. Well, the justice of God in both his grace, but also his justice in punishing evil. And so annihilationists would say that those who believe and are saved enter into Christ's presence forever. Those who did not believe and therefore are not saved are not tortured for all eternity, but rather are annihilated. Their soul ceases to exist. Now, some people counter that no, the soul lives forever. The soul is immortal. And I'm not sure personally, and this is apart from any of the holding to any of the three views, I'm not sure that's true. It seems to me that God alone gives life. Let there be life. God in Genesis creates life. There was no pre-existence of that life before. So it seems to me God creates life and God sustains life. Well, Mark, um, there's a time in my life where I called you professor. I may not have said that out loud, but I said it at least in my mind. I uh, really enjoyed uh, the times that I got to spend in San Diego uh, learning from you as a New Testament scholar. I think I own all of your books. I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's good to see you again. Great to be with you, Jim. Thanks. I appreciate you being willing to take on this uh, topic, I guess, broadly. I don't know if eternity is the right topic or uh, really the the idea of the human being having a, a life after all that we know here on earth. So I'd like to just to jump in it. Uh, you, you are a New Testament uh, scholar. You are a Christian. You are a believer uh, in the Bible. And let's, let's just throw that first big, broad question out. From a Christian perspective, is there life after death? And how do we justify that? That's a great question. And of course, when we say, is there life after death, we tend to be thinking in terms of, do we, do we continue to live after this physical life? Hmm. But in fact, that question has a much deeper application, really. And that is, is there life after death? death, which entered the world um, at, mm. at the beginning. And um, because death is viewed from a biblical perspective as an unnatural state for human beings. Human beings were created in the image of God and were meant to live with God forever. And so it was only, according to the biblical testimony, it's only because of Adam and Eve's rejection of God that death entered into the world. Paul makes a big point of that, of course, in Romans 5. But of course, God makes a big point of it. He says, on the day you eat of it, you will die. And so that spiritual death that occurred at the moment of Adam and Eve's rejection of God's life, really, because God gave them life. It was a gift from him. Um, and, and so their rejection of that resulted in death. And so death is not just part of the natural cycle of humanity. Death is an unnatural play state that people have been in since Adam and Eve fell. And so the question of is there life after death is really, is God going to restore human beings to a relationship with him that creates a life as it was meant to be originally, a restoration? Really, it is a restoration of the life God intended for human beings. And the answer to the question then is absolutely there is, and that is because of the gift of, of Christ, because of what Christ accomplished, um, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension is is viewed um, as a as a really a restoration and a renewal, um, a, a correcting of what Adam and Eve did when they fell into sin and rejected God's life. Yeah, even the way I I uh, positioned the the question kind of uh, makes it makes it clear that we 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 actually start with the wrong wrong premise and and uh, that might have a lot to do with why we sometimes hold on to this life 
so, so hard because it's all that we know. And maybe we haven't backed up the truck enough to gain a better perspective um, um, about, in fact, we often say she is in a better place or he is in a better place or she is no longer in pain. He is no longer in pain. All those things being true, but sometimes maybe lacking a broader and deeper uh, per perspective. So, so Mark, when, when, when I die, um, where do I go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that is actually a great question uh, because, you know, of course the immediate Christian answer is I go to heaven, mm -hmm. uh, but there is actually a measure of debate related to that. And mm -hmm. the debate centers, especially on um, the nature of human beings. Are human beings made up of one part? In other words, are we souls, if you will, that um, are we made of two parts? Do we have a material and an immaterial part? Are we made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit? And if so, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? And that, that's a, a live question among philosophers and among theologians. And I'm not going to give you a simple answer, but um, I do know some some Christians believe that really they're monists. They believe that human beings are are one. There is no distinction between the spiritual world or the spiritual part of them and the physical part. And those would believe in what we would call soul sleep, where the moment you die, um, really your, your body and soul stay together in the grave and your soul goes to sleep until the resurrection when your body comes to life and your soul also is restored. And in other words, there's never ever a separation between body and, and spirit. Um, and if that were, is the case, it's it's not really a problem because the moment you die, the next event you perceive is the resurrection. So it, 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 to be, you know, to die then is to be uh, essentially enter into eternal life at that moment, because that's the moment when Christ raises the dead. Um, that's a possible interpretation, uh, possible, tr possibly true, but I, I think I would argue that the Bible teaches there is a separation between body and spirit or soul. Um, I would not be a, a tri triest uh, or three parts, depending on how you want to say that. I think, uh, you know, two parts is enough to explain it. But I do think that that the immaterial part of human beings can be separated from the body. Of course, Paul says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Uh, Jesus says to the criminal on the cross who repents, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, suggesting it's not just at the future resurrection that he would receive life. Uh, the parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus, even though it's not necessarily a, a complete depiction of what afterlife is, suggests that there is continuing conscious existence immediately after death, and that it does not wait till the resurrection. So I would say, I would say the Bible pretty clearly teaches that at the moment of death, your spirit immediately enters the presence of God, and then your body awaits the resurrection. And I think that latter, the second statement is really the, the important one that we don't often emphasize as Christians. And that is that, that the resurrection, really eternal life is not just spiritual life with God as a disembodied spirit. Eternal life is the restoration of creation, which is very physical. It's spiritual and physical at the same time. It's, it, it's, it's a true spiritual life in the sense that it's in a right relationship with God. Um, but God is not going to just create heaven and send us to heaven. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And so the depiction in the last few chapters of Revelation is of the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. And it is a physical place, physical in the same sense that Jesus mm -hmm. rose bodily from the dead, physical in the same sense that we will receive a body when we're resurrected. It'll be a different kind of body, but it will be a body nevertheless. So it is really um, almost a platonic or a Gnostic idea that we are disembodied spirits, and that's going to be our eternal existence is kind of as angels or spirits with God. We are going to be resurrected into physical bodies, and those bodies will be in the same relationship to, to God that Adam and Eve in one sense had, and that is a, a relationship of e an eternal relationship um, with God. Uh, um, Paul talks about that that body in first Corinthians 15. That's probably the clearest description mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, for, for those who, uh, is, is trichotomy the right term? Trichotomy, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that's, a, that's a better term. Yeah, is, is uh, 
for those who believe in that, how do they differentiate between the soul and the spirit? I'm not sure many do. I'm not sure many have really thought through that distinction. Um, okay. Um, and, and it's only the fact that like in first Thessalonians at the end of first Thessalonians, Paul says something like, may you be kept body, soul, and spirit. So he uses all three terms, but I don't think he is saying there is a body, there's a spirit, there is a, there is a soul. I don't think he's separating those. I think we often, we often use a number of terms, mm -hmm. love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. You could, you could add five mm -hmm. or six more and you're not saying there's additional components. You're saying these are facets or way we look at the human human being mm -hmm. um, in terms of emotions, in terms of cognition, in terms of all of those things. So I think you can name a number of things. I mean, if, if, if you're a trichotomist, body, soul, and spirit, what about the heart, for example? I mean, mm -hmm. that's another term. Yeah. That, that's, what about the flesh? You know, uh, there's all kinds of terms and they're not terms that have a single meaning. They're terms that have a variety of meanings throughout scripture. So I, I don't think... Um, trichotomists necessarily have a better explanation. Um, I, I had a theology professor years ago who said something to the effect that um, he felt like, in a sense, the soul, the term soul refers to the life force. And in this life, it's tied to the body, but after life, it's, it's no longer tied to the body. And so, in a sense, the spirit after death merges with the soul. And, and before death, the soul is part of the body. I, I don't know whether that's the way to explain it, but the, but soul doesn't mean either spirit or body. It means the life force that is animated in the body or that exists independently of the body after after death. I see. I see. Yeah, I'm one of those weird guys that actually has spent many hours contemplating all these different <laughs> things. <laughs> for first, for my own selfish, you know, uh, uh, wonderings. Uh, I think God kind of draws me to those kinds of things, right? For me, that is a type of worship where I continue to lean in, want to know more, want to know more. Not that I distrust. Of course, I have faith issues, you know, from, from time to time, this way or that way. But, um, I, I and, and, and that kind of, of course, you know, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a question mark just for a second. And we'll come back to it in a little bit. So I'm imagining, this this new existence something that that i have probably experienced in part but not in full meaning the new heaven the new earth and the new a new body um and it, i have no basis for this belief i don't think other than logic and then going back to the book of genesis where i'm thinking we're really not going to be singing songs through eternity, um, are we? Um, won't we still be learning somehow? How can that? How how can learning, developing, experimenting, creating, growing, um, developing, uh, even competing? How do all those things exist in a non sinful? environment are the, are can they be differentiated i mean i i know you well enough to know you have thought about a lot of this stuff <laughs> yeah and i'm not sure i'm going to give any better answers i think i'd rather hear you you describe it um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it, in many ways and if you want to get really controversial you can say you know um in 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 heaven in you know in the kingdom of god Really, it uh, it's hard for us to even fathom because, I mean, we talk about, you know, American values, let's say, American values of democracy, of freedom of speech, of freedom of religion. Mm. Well, in, in the way we think of them, there's no, nothing like that in the kingdom of God because there is no freedom of religion in the sense there's only worship <laughs> of God. We're going to be united in our worship of God. There's no freedom of speech in the sense that freedom of speech, we think of dissenting voices. So are there going to be dissenting voices in heaven? And like you said, you just use the word creative, creative thought, imaginative thought. Uh, this is one of the fundamental things that makes us human. Right. And yet, generally, we think of creative thought as disruptive thought, as thought which challenges the status quo, challenges that, that thinks beyond the, the way we normally conceive of things. Is there, is there going to be any of that in heaven? 
Um, and I think Glenn Scorgi, you know my colleague Glenn Scorgi. Yes, I do. How is he doing? He's doing well. He retired last year, but okay. he, is very, he is still vigorous and engaged in a whole lot of different things. I will call him the movie professor for as long as I yeah. live. Yeah. <laughs> he would teach yeah. classes after he after he would show uh, clips of movies and we right, would talk right. about that. But anyway, keep going with your no, 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 the movie, consciousness. Yeah, he teaches movie theology. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but but I think he would say, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he would say you're misunderstanding what it means to be created in the image of God. If you mm. talk about dissenting voices and things like that. Um, so the in the new creation, we will share so much of God's nature because we are creating his image that dissent will not be something that is an option, really. It, and it's not something we would even want to pursue, if you will. Now, to me, that's inconceivable. But then I'm living in the, this, you know, pre-kingdom existence at this point, yeah. or pre, pre-eternal or perfection um, existence. And so it's just hard for me to conceive of, of that because in, in my experience, um, it, to be creative means to be disruptive in some ways. To be creative means right. to challenge the status quo. Um, so, but... Yeah, you're you're getting me thinking too, <laughs> even you know e- even more. And uh, I had a nice chronological list of questions for us to talk about, and I knew that it was going to create uh, some things which I think will be fun fun to talk about. Before I continue, here's another uh, another digress. Uh, before I continue, th- that kind of brings up a lot of questions in in the minds of many people who have spent even just a little bit of time learning about what is called the end times or probably you know better known as in 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 its sense of the power um and here it is is you know kind of around that idea of rapture and 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 you know believers disappearing off the, the the planet even though the bible doesn't talk much about it what it when it does talk about it it seems extremely clear that many will disappear and then i think to myself well wait a second meanwhile back at the ranch people are still getting married or they're still having children and then and then and then at some point there is this second coming and so do we have people in their in their fallen body hanging out with people in their glorified body you know and and even though it will be very clear who christ is some will still not choose and all of that is like it just kind of like blows my mind it, it's beyond any sci-fi you know movie that i i, I can come up with um uh, and at some point you know i just stopped thinking about it because there's just there's so many anything you want to say about <laughs> about that part <laughs> i'm glad you don't you don't open cans of worms <laughs> of course, you said a mouthful. I mean, what you said is is most of what you said is related to a particular strain of theology known as dispensationalism. Yeah, dispensational theology, and I know you're well aware of that, uh, Jim. Um, and if if you say what does the church believe about the end times, um, what the church universal, and that is by universal, I mean those who who would say that the Bible is the word of God, it is God's self-revelation, uh, Jesus was who he claimed to be, etc. Uh, they would say that um, Christ is going to return to establish his eternal kingdom at some point. And that's about all they would say. <laughs> and right. that at that point, there's going to be a judgment um, and the righteous will enter into eternity with God and the unrighteous will enter into separation from God. And that, that that's the whole end times right there. Everything else is details. And of course, <laughs> what you were describing is, is known as dispensational theology. And some would say it is fundamentally biblical. It comes right out of the text. Others would say it was created by a guy named J.D. Darby in the 1800s and got a grip on in America, but has not dominated the church, church history, has not been a major part of church history or, or the history of theology. Um, but dispensationalists um, piece together details about the end times, the way they perceive them. Um, and um, they would argue a scenario where um, basically 
Christ returns twice. He returns at the rapture of the church, and this is taken out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he comes back and, and he um, the church is raptured, or they, they are they ascend and meet Christ um, in the air and then go to heaven. And basically dispensationalism, why, why does the church leave? Well, the church leaves because God isn't finished with Israel yet. And so mm. Israel's prophetic clock froze when they rejected the Messiah in the first century. But that prophetic clock is going to start again when the church, which is viewed as a parenthesis in God's whole plan, uh, that the church age from the beginning of the church in Pentecost until the rapture of the church is a, is a parenthesis that wasn't part of God's original design. It only became part of God's original design because Israel rejected the kingdom that God had prepared for them. So God, his alternate plan was to use the church to establish his will and purpose on earth. Uh, at some point, he's going to take the church out of the way and God's going to once again deal with Israel. And that's going to entail a period of intense persecution known as the tribulation, a seven-year period of the tribulation. There's going to be the rise of the Antichrist. There's going to be the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple, since there seems to be some kind of defilement of the, of the Jerusalem temple. At the end of that seven-year period, right when it looks like the Antichrist and his followers are going to succeed, uh, Christ is going to return and defeat the forces of evil and establish the kingdom. So there's going to be a rapture, a seven-year tribulation, and then he's going to establish the kingdom, but it's not the final kingdom. It's called the millennial kingdom. It's a 1,000-year yes. reign of Christ at that point, um, during which, and this is what when you were talking about, people will enter into that who are not in their glorified bodies because they weren't raptured. They were on, remained on earth. So you're going to have glorified believers ruling over an earth that is made up of, of regular human beings. Uh, some and believers. some believers by then and some not. Well, well some would say theory. some would say they have to all be believers because all unbelievers are judged at the moment of oh. Christ's return. Some would say that. And mm. therefore everyone enters as believers, but they have children over the thousand years, and many of them are not believers. At the end of that thousand years, then Satan, who was bound during the thousand years, is released. Uh, this is in Revelation 19 and 20, is released, um, and he starts a rebellion, which lasts very which is a very short. <laughs> Christ intervenes, defeats Satan, throws Satan um, the, in, into the lake of fire for all eternity. Um, and then the eternal state begins where all people get, all believers get their glorified bodies and enter into the new heaven and the new earth, the end of revelation. And so that, that whole theology of not just the return of Christ in the kingdom, but rather the rapture of the church, the tribulation period, the rise of the Antichrist, the millennial kingdom of a thousand years, and then the eternal state. That is pieced together from various different passages. Um, there's no single passage that talks about both returns of Christ. But dispensationalists have that system that they piece it all together and would say that this is how it's going to work out. And scripture teaches teaches that. Um, so that, that that's... That's great. No, you. I think you did a really great job at kind of piecing that together. So, you know, to to then and I want to, you know, at the last minute, I wanted to throw that in so that the listeners really have more to contemplate, um, more to more to think about now. But going back to our, our beginning, I, I loved how you kind of re uh, uh, reframed my, my question where you said, no, wait a second. And I'm going to use Jim's words now versus versus yours, Mark. But but um uh, death is not a natural event. It wasn't part of God's original plan. And so the question really is, is God going to restore and is God restoring? And so as Christians, we believe that God is always working. God is restoring. And then uh, because of our failure, um, I will die. And I think with what I heard you say, kind of narrowing it down in your in your own theology, and I like how you do that. You you all, you've always been very benevolent to explain various positions, but you may or may not remember. I would always say, "But Mark, what do you believe?" <laughs> <laughs> and and you did that again, uh, you know, pretty much. And yet, you know, you believe, yet you have your mind open, right? And 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 and, and I, I like that. I love that about you. Uh, really, really do. So anyway, I, um, I, I die, and 
uh, perhaps I fall asleep. This is one possible option. I fall asleep along with my body, but it doesn't really matter because the next thing I'm going to experience would be the resurrection. That's, that's, that's one fork in the road. The other fork in the road is that my body dies and yes, it is still waiting for resurrection, but somehow my soul has a consciousness where um, I experience in some part the presence uh, of God. Um, And I, and I, and I too see a lot of biblical ideas of that. You know, I think about the Mount of Transfiguration and you know, who, who showed up there. And, you know, we have a couple, uh, uh, departed uh, folks who who showed up to meet these disciples with Jesus, and so then I have to think to myself, well, were they resurrected for that, and then mm-hmm. had to go back to the grave, or mm-hmm. or that would seem weird. Um, oh, now we're going to put you back to sleep. Um, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unlikely, yeah, yeah. yeah um, so I I, I I like that, even though I don't know what the consciousness means, right? Because if I don't have a body, as you said, some say that the soul is the energy um, and needs to be animated, you know, uh, through some vehicle. So if we don't have a vehicle, how, you know, how do we work, right? That's her. But, but, you know, it's a Sunday school answer for those who are listening the Bible never promises to tell us everything that we may want to know, but it gives us everything we need to know and enough to build a faith on and continue to grow, even with our logic, right? And so our logic doesn't, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, our, 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 lo- our logic does not leave us in a in a state where we're just completely confused if one right. puts, it's puts contradict the truth yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um okay so then uh, so then we 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 talked about this idea of of the rapture and of course with that the dead in christ rise and 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 we go on from there mm-hmm. and we've talked a little bit about gosh what what will heaven be like according to the bible mark and your beliefs so what does the bible say about hell and and what will hell be like there's a lot of things that the bible says about hell they all seem to be very uh contrary and displeasing are they figurative are they real uh is it eternal um i believe the seventh day adventists believe that people are annihilated if they're not believers and so when you ask them well then what do you do with the idea of eternal life being for all either in one place or another their answer as i recall in having conversations with some was that well they we all live on in the mind of god which that definitely leaves me wanting it's somewhat logical but it does leave me wanting uh how do you conclude what the bible says about this other destination yeah, um, and it is, I would say, by far and away, it is the most difficult of biblical uh, doctrines. And, and uh-huh. I think because there is so much um, about hell that seems incongruent uh, with the nature of God. There, there's much that is congruent with it, but also much that is incongruent with it. Um, and and let me take a step back and say there's there's three main Christian views, and I'll call them Christian in the sense that they're centered on Christ. They're not just we're not just saying all roads lead to God. We're saying Christ alone is the way to God. Even within that um, that specificity that Christ is alone, there are three main views, and one is you could call it universal reconciliation that ultimately all people will be saved through Christ. Um, and the through Christ is an important part to add on at the end. Um, yeah. They're not saying that everyone's just going to go to heaven because God just loves everyone and brings them into his presence. They're saying that ultimately, however long it takes, God will reconcile all people to himself um, and that they will then enter into the presence of God. Um, now, that that is challenged by Scripture. And, and I mean, it just it seems clear in Scripture that there are many that do not. 
um, are are not saved. I mean, the wicked are the wicked perish. The wicked are judged. Um, you know, Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire, where they are tormented forever and ever. It says. So that's a very difficult doctrine. Um, it, it does have scriptural support. And I would say that all three of these views have scriptural support. Um, at one point, Paul says, God is going to reconcile all things to himself, all things in heaven and all things on earth. He's going to reconcile everything to himself. Well, how could you have a, bur a hell burning in one corner of the, of the universe if, if he's reconciled? How could God be reconciled to people he's clearly alienated from? So there's, uh, there's a number of passages um, that say he's going to save all people, for example. Uh, now, that might mean all kinds of people, in other words, all ethnic ethnicities and so forth. Um, but in context, it often seems to suggest that there is, that, that in some sense, all are going to be reconciled. So, so there is biblical evidence for it. There's biblical evidence against it. The second view is the one you mentioned that, uh, that Seventh-day Adventists and actually many other Christian theologians believe, and that is annihilationism. Annihilationism um, is a way to um, attempt to understand the justice of God um, as well as, well, the justice of God in both his, um, his grace, um, but also his justice in punishing evil. And so annihilationists would say that, that those who believe and are saved enter into Christ's presence forever. Those who did not believe and therefore are not saved are not tortured for all eternity, but rather are annihilated. Their soul ceases to exist. Um, now, some people counter that, no, the soul lives forever. The soul um, is immortal. Um, and I'm not sure personally, and this is apart from any of the, holding to any of the three views, I'm not sure that's true. Um, it seems to me that God alone gives life. Um, let there be life. I mean, God in cre in Genesis creates life. There was no pre-existence of the, that life before. So it seems to me God creates life and God sustains life. So to say that the soul is going to somehow in live for in forever and ever apart from God, that's problematic to me since God gives life. Um, let me get to the third view, of course, and that's the traditional view that, that believes in um, Eternal conscious torment is sometimes the way it's described. Um, eternal conscious torment means that those who reject Christ um, will enter into a state of torment um, that lasts forever. It's not just annihilation. In other words, it's not just something they would not perceive, but it's something that actually they perceive and, and experience, truly experience for all eternity. Um, the biggest problem with that, of course, is it seems grossly unjust <laughs> in the sense that um, temporal sins are punished for eternity. People God created, himself created, he then chooses to torture, we could say, forever and ever. That doesn't sound like a, a loving God. And so that's why the traditional uh, doctrine of hell is so difficult for many believers is because it doesn't seem to comport with the, the nature of a loving God or even a just God, because a just God would punish appropriately. Um, and even, let's say, you take the worst of sinners, you take you know Hitler, um, who kills not only 6 million Jews, but millions more, 10 million people. How, what's the appropriate punishment for 10 million you know, hmm. you know, unjust deaths? Well, it would be, he must experience 10 million deaths or something like that. We would <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But eternity, eternity goes forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ever. There seems to be nothing, nothing that would um, justly result in eternal punishment. It would be commensurate punishment. Now, now, in response to that, those who believe in eternal conscious torment would say, no, every sin is an eternal sin against God because it's a sin against God the eternal God. Therefore, it has eternal consequences. Um, that's a hard one to get your head around, really, in a, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, because we don't, we are not eternal people, um, mm -hmm. naturally. We are, we're created at a point in time, and so we would expect to be punished for what we have done. And in fact, that's stated explicitly, you know, everyone will be judged, Paul says in, in Romans 2, I think, uh, according to what they have done. Um, so eternal conscious torment does not seem to go along with yeah, that kind of just um, punishment. So all three of those views have support in the Bible, and they also have, have 
um, difficulties related to both the biblical testimony, but also the nature of God. Now, have I succeeded in dodging your question sufficiently? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to say back in street terms what I've heard you say, because I, I've actually uh, had very similar, you know, dialogue with my board of directors, me, you know, me, myself and I, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, that whole idea of, of God eventually winning everyone over, right, which, which we're going to get to in a minute about the whole free will, you know, deal. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, there's a part of me that that makes sense, uh, a part of me that that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know, God is irresistible sooner or later. Um, what goes against that in, in my mind and in, in my argument with myself is there are just some people. I mean, uh, listeners, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. It's just seems like there's no evidence of love in their in their life. And they just seem to to have created themselves in as a god um mark has just mentioned hitler as an example but man i've known people that i don't know and i don't want to get extreme here but it, it, it's almost like i'm speaking to a demon mm. um ba especially based on some of the ministry past i have of working in some of the streets in la and and things like that and the things i've run into but but you know the other thing I don't like about, uh, or the other, I mean, I, I love the idea of of uh, eventual universal reconciliation. I love the idea because God wins, God's irresistible. You know, sooner or later, even the hardest heart comes around. Um, the things that that bother me about it, it, it kind of, you know, you were tapping on it, Mark. Is this? this sense of, of justice where, you know, how does, you know, we know that Billy Graham is, is no longer on the planet with us, but, you know, he and his preaching would make it extremely clear that, dude, this might be your last chance. You, you could die in a car wreck on the way home. You know, that, that reminds me of all the sermons I heard, right. you know, in the sixties and seventies, particularly. Um, and, and it, it also, makes me realize that that i don't know the, these kind of conversations build my faith they don't deconstruct my faith in any way um because i i feel like like god is honored you know by the conversation that we're trying to figure out but you know it, it kind of gives the bad guy the way out right well you know uh i'll get it i'll work on it right now i'm going to do this i'm going to do my own thing and in the next life i'll just Right. serve serve my time or whatever and then it kind of makes god a laughing stock uh sure. you know a sissy you know or whatever the second one annihilation i i kind of i i kind of like that i've never taught it i don't i can't say that i believe it but what i like about it logically is that um i've heard somebody say why am I going to be held responsible for my life when I didn't even choose to be born in the first place? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, that one, I didn't really hear that argument probably till about like 30 years ago. And I remember when I heard it for the first time, it like struck me upside the head. I thought, huh, now that's a pretty good angle. Um, my rebuttal to it and yet matching it up to annihilation is that, okay, God gave you a chance at life. You didn't, you, 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 you know, you weren't a, you weren't in a, something floating out. Please make me a human. Please make me a human. Um, here you came and you don't want it. Fine. And you have that ability, I guess, to check out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a little weird, but those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, the only thing I can say about an eternal hell is that that I do believe, like some of our Christian scientists, I don't mean the 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 religion Christian scientists. I mean scientists who are Christians, who have said that one of the reasons we can't understand certain things or see certain things is because, from a scientific perspective, we we live without certain dimensions. And, and God has more dimensions to him. 
So the only way I can 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 embrace the idea of an eternal hell is that I just can't see everything um, the way that God sees them. And so I trust that he'll do the right thing. Um, and I don't think I'm waving the white flag. I'm just saying that is a possibility for me too. Yeah. <clears throat> but as a believer, that makes me, you know, want to to reach out. So uh, where do you where do you stand, Mark? Yeah, I mean, well, I think, your, yeah. I think that last point is really important, what you just made, because I think really on many of these things we have to recognize that his thoughts are greater than our thoughts and that we can't possibly conceive of that. We really can't. We, we can't fathom the nature of the Trinity, for example. Um, right. God is three in one. The incarnation is even harder for me. Mm -hmm. And the eternal God become a baby. When Jesus entered into human life, did he have, was he schizophrenic? Did he have all this eternal <laughs> infinite knowledge over here? And then the, the knowledge of a baby over here, how did those two interact? Did, you know, it was Jesus, you know, laying in that manger going, I created all this. It's cool. Hearing prayers of a billion people. It's just, you know, it's, it's in, there's certain, the nature of God is incomprehensible. And so I think um, we have to recognize that, that this, at this point, it's income, either an eternal conscious torment or um, ultimate reconciliation or annihilationism are to us incomprehensible in the sense they don't, they're not going to make sense until we enter into the presence of, of God. I mean, it's like Calvinism and Arminianism. Or does God choose us or do we choose him? Well, you know, we throw up our hands. You can line up all the verses on one side and all the verses on the other. They And the Bible teaches both, it seems to me. The Bible teaches that we make decisions and are responsible for those decisions and we have free will. Bible also teaches that God determines all things. I mean, everything's according to his purpose and, 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 and sovereignty and so forth. So that, again, I fall back on the, the idea of mystery is that we can't conceive it. And it's not our business ultimately to, um, we recognize the reality that God is there, that he is our creator. God, we worship him. And then we wait and let him enlighten us <laughs> at the, at the appropriate, the, the appropriate time. Um, having said that, let me let me say just a, a few responses. And I, I I play the devil's advocate. Probably that's too literal. <laughs> too <laughs> in the sense that every every one of those responses to each of the views, I would I mean and going. But what about this? Um, in terms of you know universal reconciliation, some people would say there's no incentive then to believe. There's right. no incentive to believe if everyone's going to be saved. And I would just say, are you? Is that really true? If, if um, you know, if, if a, a, a um, criminal is arrested and you can say either you're going to get be released scot-free or you're going to spend 30 uh, years in hard labor, um, if you do this, um, there, there's a lot of incentive there. In other words, you yeah. know, it, it, it's not just avoiding eternal conscious torment. How about a million years of torment? <laughs> so that's, that's a lot of incentive. It's, it's that it's huge that's a lot of blisters down. that's a lot of blisters yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this idea that, that there's only you know if, if if i'm not going to be tortured for eternity then there's no reason i would possibly want to be saved are you kidding me i mean every, every there's plenty of incentive if, if incentive you know ultimately means you know a limited amount of judgment if you will yeah. and it's judgment yeah. in some sense equal or commensurate with the crime, you know, so so I, I don't think that's necessarily. Um, I, I don't think it's it's there's no incentive, or, or people say there's no incentive to go proclaim the good news to people. Well, of course there's incentive if you if you're going to, you know, prevent. Um, that's like saying there's no reason to to um, you know to go and feed the starving because you know they're just going to die, just like all of us are going to die. Well, no, you're, you're trying to alleviate suffering. Well, alleviating suffering is a worthwhile human task. And, and so it's the same. I think it, it justifies evangelism in that we want to bring people to Christ without all that torture, without all that suffering that they're going to experience if they don't follow Christ winning in the end. So that, that's my response to the, you know, the challenge of no incentive. Um, so I'll, I'll stop. I'll pause there. That's, that's good. <laughs> uh, plus, I think there is a precedent uh, from the Old Testament prophets 
to, you know, uh, John the Baptist preaching, uh, you know, Elijah, hellfire and brimstone, there, there, there's a context for it. And, and there's a precedent. We, we've known something for thousands of years, and it's, a, it's generally this, there is a hell, and you don't want to go there. <laughs> now, right? Isn't that good enough, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, is there an exit door? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, but it, one thing the Bible makes extremely clear is there is another place and you don't want to go there. Um, exactly. Right. Exactly. I, I think that's, you know, uh, you also reminded me of a, of a funny story. And I'm, I'm trying to make this guy famous in, in telling you this story. His name is, uh, um, Winston Harris, he is, he's a, um, uh, one of the younger pastors at a church here in San Antonio. And we were having chips and queso one day. Um, and somehow we got into some deep theological <laughs> discussions about stuff. And I don't even remember what it was, but right in the middle of him picking up a chip and dipping it in the queso, he looks at me and he says, it's a necessary mystery. <laughs> and, and, and I have never forgotten that phrase ever since. And as soon as you said, you know, to some extent, we need to have room for, for mystery, even in our relationships, our human relationships. Um, I've been married for 43 years. And every once in a blue moon, I learn something about my wife, Rhonda, that I didn't know. <laughs> Yep. How is that even possible? Yep. How How is Very that good. even possible, right? Yep. So let me ask you a, a pastoral uh, question. Um, it, it, it probably seems minute. It probably seems to a lot of people, you know, I'm a bit of a cynic. So when I learn, I learn hard. I mean, I lean in hard. Um, I'm not there to get a grade. That's a waste of time. That's stupid. I'm, I, I'm really there to learn. And I remember when I was in seminary, I don't remember where, I don't remember when, but somewhere it came up. It might have been at Bethel. It might have been at ISOT, International School of Theology. Heck, it might have been with my dad teaching me when I was younger uh that that christian that there there at least was and i don't even know if this is true mark there at least was if there isn't today a a christian tradition almost a doctrine and maybe a doctrine uh of burial versus cremation and as i recall it had less to do with the idea of what God can do, right? If you blow up in a plane, he still knows where you are. If that even matters, I, I don't even know that that matters, but, um, but it was a, it's a picture for the world to see of being laid in the ground, you know, and then, and then to be resurrected, you know, similar to the way we baptize. Um, now, I was baptized three times frontwards uh, when I was a little boy because I happened to be in a brethren group that right. uh, that apparently got started. And one of their, the main things they wanted to do was defend what you mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, the Trinity. You know, and I remember as an eight year old trying to figure out whether I should hold, try to hold my breath through all three donks or just <laughs> sneak in a breath in between. <laughs> But, uh, you know, cremation for baptism. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I, I, yeah, I think the pastor probably should have talked to me about that because because one could take on a gallon of water if they don't think through that really well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we were also doing the feet washing and stuff like that. You know, it was it was, sure. it, was it was in those days. But but, you know, there's a lot of things today about being a steward of the planet. Um, about the expense and being a steward of our finances. And so cremation um, seems to have taken over the norm than, than, than burial. Um, what, are, what, are your, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm going to be boring on this one because okay. um, I think it, obviously burial um, in some ways reflects better the imagery, just as you were saying, Christ died, 
He was placed in a grave. He rose from the grave. We die in Christ. We rise with Christ. Um, Paul's description of 1 Thessalonians you know, 4, where the dead in Christ will rise first. And they'll meet, the spirit will meet the body, I think is what it's saying, because it says Jesus will bring with him those who fall asleep. He's bringing with them, but they're coming up too. So there's, there must Mm -hmm. be, uh, there's this merging of body and spirit at that point. uh, All that imagery suggests a grave is perhaps a better analogy. But in reality, just like you said, people are vaporized, you know, people are eaten by sharks. Yeah. Um, uh, You know, (coughs) The vast majority of humanity is probably not buried. Well, I don't know what percentage would be buried and what percentage would be not. Um, And yet that does not impede the resurrection. The idea that something as mundane as that could could thwart God's resurrection power is absurd. Um, So um, that would suggest that that, burial is certainly not necessary um, for salvation or for resurrection. but the question really that you're raising is, but it, does God desire us to do that? Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't see any direct commands in scripture to do that. I think if it was <coughs> that essential or that necessary, then it would be commanded, um, you know, as part of the Old Testament law for Israel. And then as part of the law of Christ, Christ teaching in the New Testament. And I don't think we see that. Instead, we see what we see throughout Scripture, and as we see cultural adaptation, um, basically what what is common um, in the cultural context is what what is done. And so, I don't personally, I don't, I would not side strongly with either side here. I don't think um, I don't think burial is necessary, and um, I think cremation is, you know. In, in some situations in particular, it's much more convenient and much more appropriate uh, to the cultural situation. So uh-huh. I would, yeah, I would. Yeah. The first, yeah. I, 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 I have never viewed myself as a traditionalist, but the older I get, the more I sometimes realize that I took a lot of things to heart and, and now I'm kind of unpacking those. And, I don't think I'm the only one. And so thank you for for answering that. I think you answered that really well. Uh, Mark, Dr. Strauss, I have one more question for you. It's a a personal nature and uh, it's just an opportunity for people to hear your heart, although I think they've heard it loud and clear, you know, as you have been walking through these questions. I had people uh, because I I was a second career person. I was a business banker and uh, turned pastor. And today I kind of live in both worlds. Um, um, I I love working with leaders and I love working with people that are trying to make a difference, whether it's a taco stand, you know, that they're opening or or they're leading a publicly traded company um, or a large ministry or a small ministry. I just love working with leaders. But I actually had people in my life who told me, do not go to seminary (laughs) um, because it will become a cemetery for your faith. And of course, that became more and more of a of a joke. It scared me a little bit. Um, It did not have that effect on me, although I have to say I got T-boned a few times through the process because I had to think through some of my preconceived ideas. And I actually found that to be intellectually stimulating. Um, but here you are, I mean, you, uh, you are a professor at seminary. You are the author of multiple books and uh, your commentary, um, the, the, one of the most recent ones that, uh, that you did. Um, I have just behind me on my left shoulder. Um, After all these years of studying and teaching and talking about things like this, um, how how would you describe your faith today versus when you first entered into going to seminary in the first place? I think you you suggested this. It's more complicated. There's no doubt about that in the sense that 
we we come oftentimes with a very simplistic view. And as children, certainly to explain something to a child, you have to be simple. You have to be clear. You have to be black and white. It, uh, um, and uh, I think one, what people are fear and what often happens in seminary is we haven't taught people very well in church because we do make it, you know, the Bible is God's inerrant word, we say. And, and um, we believe that it, it is without error. Um, and then we add the phrase technically in the original autographs, um, which we don't have. And so <laughs> suddenly you've created um, a bit of a compromise there. And pe- we don't say that in church. Um, right. We don't talk about the fact that language itself is inherently unstable and ambiguous um, and inexact. And therefore, God communicating to us through language is going to be inexact and imperfect. And so we get to seminary and we learn that and that throws us because we've been taught to think in terms of, of absolutes. Um, and I think um, we need to, uh, this, this is a whole lecture unto itself, of course, but in churches, we need to be more nuanced. We need to explain um, you know, these things. We do need to talk about the text of scripture and how we don't have a perfect text, but we have a true text. We need, need to talk about how interpretations are going to differ, but ultimately the essential message is protected by the Holy Spirit and is retained by the church um, in, in all of its manifestations. And so we, we need to be more nuanced in the way we teach um, at, at, at church from, from the earliest days so that people aren't shocked when they go off to college or shocked when they go off to seminary. That's really, really important. But I, I also feel like we then need to get back to what is essential. And that is a relationship with God and with one another. Uh, G- Jesus boiled it down to two commands, loving God and loving people. And uh, really, th- those have to be the priority in all of our all of our discussion. And so the question isn't, are you going to be able to resolve every theological issue in question? The question is, do you know God and do you love God? And are, is that love for God manifesting itself in loving others? Um, the, the, you know, the, the most radical thing Jesus ever said was love your enemies. Um, well, that reflects exactly what God did when people huh. turned against God. God did not destroy them. Huh. Instead, he loved them enough to find a means, a, a way to bring them back into right relationship at his own cost, to his own detriment. Um, and so that becomes the model then for, for humanity in terms of how we live. We live a life of loving those who don't love us. Uh, and, and that will radically transform transform the world. So I think I would say we don't need to get bogged down on all of the, we, don't, we, we can discuss this theology forever. It's, it's fun to do, right? We can seek to resolve it in our own mind, but it's not about the resolution of these theological puzzles. It's about knowing God and loving him and loving, loving others. And that fulfills the law of Christ. Um, and and so the church with all of its complex problems and challenges uh, don't need to simply condemn others uh, we, we need to demonstrate Christ's love we we will we will transform the world by giving and loving self sacrificially uh, not by by hating or complaining or um, you know um responding with evil, which is, I think, too often what we see is, is Christians respond with anger and evil rather than with, with the fundamental nature of God, which is to love. So. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Really well said. I think when I was younger, I didn't know what to fight for. I thought there was just so many things. As I get older, um, I mean, your, your answer to my question right there, I don't need to say anything more. I uh, I think Rick Warren did a really good job when he first started uh, Saddleback teaching the people from the very beginning, you know, we're going to be about the essentials. And then he, you know, clearly defined what they were and they were very small. Um, and I, uh, I think about that. And then of course you, you'd already mentioned this too, but you know, if, if, if it's hard for people to understand the gospel, they just need to go back to that story about that one thief that was hanging on the cross. That's a pretty powerful story um, for for me and anyone that would spend time. Mark, thank you so much for 
giving of your time and uh, your mind and your thoughts um, to this. And I know this podcast is going to be so encouraging to so many. Um, and it's great seeing you again. And good to see you, Jim. Thanks for initiating this. I've really enjoyed my time. And thanks for what you do. Um, you know, I think this is great for the church and, and it's people thinking and draws them closer to God. So God bless you for what you're doing.